Well, thank you for coming. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotech Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And thanks for coming to this presentation and the groundbreaking discoveries in CALS seminar. It's a rather unusual seminar where on Monday we have a presentation from a professor emeritus on a particular department or topic from the College of Ag and Life Sciences here at UW-Madison. And then on Thursday we have a current professor who gives uh, an update on current research from the same field as the person who spoke on Monday. Uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Michael Collins. He's with Pathobiological Sciences at the School of Veterinary Medicine here at UW-Madison. He was born in St. Paul and went to uh, high school at Columbia Heights, just north of Minneapolis. And then he got his undergraduate degree and his DVM in six years, that pretty amazing program, uh, at the University of Minnesota. Then he went to the University of Georgia to get a PhD in medical microbiology, where he finished up in 1976. And then he went to Colorado State University in Fort Collins for his first faculty job and decided the mountains were way too much to look at. So in 1983, he came here to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today he's going to talk with us about Yoni's disease. So please, would you join me in welcoming Professor Michael Collins to Groundbreaking Discoveries in Cows. And this is where we clap. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So today uh, I'm going to pick up where Dr. Easterday left off on Monday um, with this man named uh, Dr. Beach. He was a member of the Veterinary Science Department, formed here in uh, 1910, 11, and he published a monograph, it was about a dozen and a half pages, and it described everything that he'd learned about Yoni's disease. It showed the pathology, uh, same as today. It showed the uh, few herds out of some 30,000 at that point in time in Wisconsin that were infected. And he said he, he wrote this monograph in order to um, highlight to breeders and veterinarians alike that this new disease was emerging and we needed to take some steps to eliminate it. And he went on to say, as quoted there, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, especially regarding Yoni's disease, because if we could deal with this infectious problem early, we could avoid a lot of pain and suffering downstream. Well, as you'll soon learn, uh, we didn't listen to the wise advice of Dr. Beach and Hastings and the consequences of this failed biosecurity, the consequences of fail, failing to prevent the infection from moving from one herd to another results in cows that have this chronic, wasting, infectious disease of their intestinal tract that causes them to go downhill fast and stop producing milk. Although they will look like they feel okay because they're bright and alert and they're continuing to eat like the other herd mates, but they just are broken inside. And the only way to diagnose this at that point in time uh, convincingly was to grow the organism on culture media. And what makes this pathogen so unique is, is, is that it's the slowest growing of all the bacterial pathogens we deal with in veterinary medicine or human medicine. Uh, so from the time you inoculate these test tubes of culture media till the time you see bacterial colonies typically is three months. Not a fast diagnosis. So this is a photograph of the germ about a scanning electron micrograph, about 50,000 times magnification, and you see this uh, lumpy, bumpy shaped uh, rod uh, shaped organism that is today named Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis. So it has other cousins with other subspecies name, but only the paratuberculosis one causes Yoni's disease, and because the name's so long, we abbreviate it MAP. This disease is uh, becoming critically important uh, as a potential zoonotic disease. As far back as 1913, it was recognized that people who develop a similar intestinal problem, known today as Crohn's disease, have, intestinal, have clinical signs that are basically the same. Chronic diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weight loss. And I would venture to say that many of you in this room know somebody that has Crohn's disease because it's sadly fairly common. When you take out the affected parts of the intestine from a human being with Crohn's disease, 
it grossly, to the naked eye, looks just the same as it does, uh, as Yoni's disease does in cattle. Thick, corrugated, non-ulcerated uh, intestinal tract. In fact, the very first surgeon to describe this condition in 1913 in Scotland commented in his original manuscript that this looks just like the disease that Yoni, Dr. Yoni, described in cattle. And today, with advances in technology for diagnostics, we now know that roughly 50% of these Crohn's patients test positive for the paratuberculosis bacteria. Not only that, but multiple studies in multiple countries, including a study done here in the United States by Marshfield Clinic, show that you can go to the retail store and purchase pasteurized milk and culture this bacteria live from a low percentage of milk samples. But this has been replicated in many countries, as you see. Most alarmingly, and most recently, this organism has been isolated from baby infant formula. Again, researchers went to the store, bought powdered infant formula products, reconstituted them, and were able to grow paratuberculosis bacteria. I'm not going to say anything um, more about this as a zoonotic problem. That's the subject of about an hour and a half lecture, which I'll give in a uh, couple weeks to an epidemiology class. But, but it, I use it as an introduction to this topic to show you that this is a really critical problem that we have to understand in veterinary medicine. Because if it is a zoonotic disease, the fix has to come on the farm, and we have to prevent the infection. So in 1983, um, I had the opportunity to come here as the school was being born. Dr. Easterday invited me to join the faculty, and that's been uh, the source of a lot of enjoyment in my life. I have enjoyed coming to work um, all 35 years that I've been here. And while this is supposed to be for contemporary faculty, I suspect that it won't be too very long where I'm joining the emeritus group as well. And yes, this is uh, the sign that Dr. Easterday mentioned. We've named the street uh, where the vet school is for this founding dean. My work is uh, a little bit different maybe than you might have seen in some other presentations here because um, I'm a veterinarian, which gives me very broad interests, and I'm a microbiologist, and I like working with animals. So it's been a, a mix of some research, which I'll show you, some diagnostic testing to find better ways of diagnosing the infections, but also to go on farms and use these tests, some field investigations I'll talk about, as well as outreach and education to try to spread the word about this infection. So I consider this a uh, continuation of that first monograph that Beach and Hastings published from the journal uh, in uh, 1922 from the Veterinary Science Department. So it's going to sort of go chronologically and sort of by subject area. So I might jump, uh, jump years a little bit. But let's talk about research first. As I showed you, the uh, classical way to diagnose whether this cow has Yoni's disease or not is to take a fecal sample, process it to kill most of the other microbes, inoculate this culture media, and come back three months later to see if you have any colonies growing. And so tackling that problem as a microbiologist, I wanted to see if some of the technology that was being used for human tuberculosis could be adapted for use in cattle. In humans at that time, in 1983, 86, this, uh, they made a, a culture medium that was in a bottle with a sealed rubber stopper on top. And the food for the bacteria was labeled with a carbon-14. And when the bacteria grew and they used that food, palmitic acid, uh, a special instrument would stick a needle through the top of the bottle look at, aspirate the atmosphere, and measure radioactive carbon dioxide, indicating, oh, there's some bacteria growing in the bottle that are using palmitic acid. And so <clears throat> we were uh, a little bit of a race with the veterinary school at Cornell to try to adapt this technology for use for diagnosis of Yoni's disease. And I'm, I'm pleased to say we succeeded, and, and we beat Cornell. Um, we not only used that as a diagnostic tool, and here you see a uh, veterinary student and a grad student doing the hard work of collecting fecal samples on a farm to come back to the laboratory to work on this. But we also use this technology for counting mycobacteria. You'd be surprised how important it is for many research projects to simply be able to count accurately live bacteria. Not dead ones, 
like PCR, but only live ones. And so using the carbon dioxide that, that's released in the Bactech bottle, we we're able, able to translate that data from the Bactech machine into an estimated count for the number of paratuberculosis bacteria in a sample. And as you'll see, uh, we've used that in many different ap research applications downstream. By 1990, the company had improved their machine, which formerly required that you insert a bottle one at a time, lower a lever, wait a full minute, and then, and then uh, release the bottle to get your reading. They invented a little bit of robotics so that we could load 60 bottles onto a machine like this, close the lid, and the machine would automatically rotate them through the detector, insert a needle, measure the CO2, and give us a digital readout. Much more handy. Uh, we still had to take the bottles out of the incubator on a regular schedule, put them on the machine, move them back to the incubator. So it was an advance. Um, in a lot of this work, I'm going to show you where some of my students have gone because the, the applications or the impact of this research is not just the publication or the advances in science, but it's who did we train and what did they contribute to the world. So the guy that I showed you scooping manure from cows ended up being a dean at the university and professor at the University of Milwaukee College of Health Sciences and he's gone on to become the uh, president of Aurora Research Institute, Dr. Randy Lambrecht. One of his contemporaries, shown here, Becky Van Boxtel, looked at this organism to try to understand, is there some way we can speed this thing up to make it grow faster? And one of the components that you put into media to make this kind of bacteria grow faster is called tween, functions sort of as a detergent that help get, helps get nutrients from outside the cell into inside the cell. But she showed that when you add tween, the organism looks like the colony morphology changes completely. If you don't add tween, it's very rough and it grows slower. If you do add tween, it grows faster, but it also changes its colonial morphology. It also changes its morphology when you look under the electron microscope. And this is one of Becky's pictures. It's become really popular among paratuberculosis researchers. Um, and, and that's the rough form of the organism grown without tween. It would look very smooth on the surface. And it's important for us to know whether what we're growing in the laboratory is the same germ or behaving the same way as the germ would be inside the cow. Is it smooth or is it rough? Are there different antigens? Does the host respond in a different way? All these are basic questions fundamental to the pathogenesis. Becky went on to be a microbiologist at the Wisconsin uh, laboratory of, st State Laboratory of Hygiene. Uh, one of the things I'm uh, somewhat noted for is taking sabbaticals. I've done four during my career, one while I was at Colorado. After coming here, my first opportunity for sabbatical came in 8990 and I went to uh, Australia as they were building their um, paratuberculosis program. I had a chance to work in that country, uh, lived there for a year, and asked the question, how can a paratuberculosis spread, which is a disease that spreads from the manure of adult cows in a, getting into the mouths of baby calves, it's easy to understand how an intensive agricultural system where there's a lot of manure and a concentration of animals, why this disease would be transmitted. But in Australia, the cows rarely go into the barn. In fact, there usually isn't a barn. There's a milking shed, and they're out um, on pasture all the time. So <clears throat> as a research challenge, I had the chance to look at their animal husbandry systems and see how that impacted per um, paratuberculosis. While there, I worked with um, epidemiologists who helped teach me computer modeling. When you have events that occur on a very, very slow time scale, whether it's Yoni's disease that spreads over decades in a dairy herd, or global climate change, or any number of things, computer models can help us understand how this works, what's going into those models, and it can lead us back to the farm to understand how do we intervene. In this case of this model, we were able to predict <clears throat> the spread of paratuberculosis and the decrease rate of infection if we instituted animal management changes 
or diagnostic tests, or did the two things together. Coming back to Wisconsin, we used some of the uh, new technology, blood testing, to survey the state for how many herds were infected. And Dr. Don Socket led that effort, uh, discovering by that time in history, uh, the rate of infection in Wisconsin had already jumped up to 30% of Wisconsin herds. Dr. Socket's now part of the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. My next sabbatical was in 96-97, and I took the opportunity to go work in the Netherlands, where they too were building a paratuberculosis control program. I had the great good fortune of working with a friend, Dr. Case Callis. He was um, predominantly trained as a bovine practitioner uh, with a specialty in uh, reproduction, but he was also keenly interested in paratuberculosis. And Case and I got to go work on a lot of different farms in the Netherlands, all of whom were concerned about paratuberculosis and trying to figure out how to deal with it. And, and we, did, we launched some projects that different farms use different strategies, and it taught me a lot about paratuberculosis. The country also wanted to develop a program to certify which herds were not infected. And this is one of our early models, written in Dutch, showing a system where we could test herds. Uh, those that were infected, we'd set them on a control program. Those that were completely test negative, we'd come back a year later and do another round of testing, probably find a few more herds. And then by successive tests, we would be increasingly confident that the remaining herds were not infected with paratuberculosis. Brought that those concepts and the spreadsheets that we built during that year on sabbatical back to the United States that led to design of a, a somewhat more simplified program, which ultimately became codified in USDA regulations for what is a national voluntary uh, control program for this disease in cattle. Back to the bench, uh, this young scientist, Ben Yang Zhao, was working on trying to understand what's happening at the cellular level. These are macrophages growing in culture in the laboratory. The <coughs> red stuff are the mycobacteria that are happily growing inside these cells. These are the cells that our bodies and animal bodies depend on to kill off germs, basically. And mycobacteria, like this one, have totally outwitted the host's immune response have totally outwitted the ability of these cells to kill them. And so <clears throat> our work together with Dr. Sprinsky back here in the back of the room uh, was understanding some of the mechanisms of what's going on inside the cells and why aren't they more effective at killing. Uh, Dr. Zhao went on to head the, and currently heads, the Mycobacteriology Laboratory for the New York City Public Health Laboratory. Another one of my great grad students was Nak Moon Sung, came to me from Korea with an interest in food science and food microbiology. So I used, I capitalized on that interest to try to understand how this organism might be getting past pasteurizers. So we needed to understand how does this organism respond to heat? Pasteurization is another than, nothing other than moderately low temperature heat, 72 Celsius, for a period of time, typically 15, maybe 20 seconds. But nobody had defined how much time and how much heat is required to kill the organism. So he was the first one to produce what's called a D-value. That's plotting how much time and how, much, uh, how many survivors do you have of the bacteria, and you're seeing what is called a thermal death curve. More, with longer and longer time, fewer and fewer organisms survive. So that is uh, what food scientists call a D-value, a thermal death curve, and it allows them pr to predict, will pasteurization be good enough? Would pasteurization be better if we increase the temperature or increase the time? The long and the short of it was we found out that this pathogen is harder to kill than most other pathogens that we find in raw milk. And that high thermal tolerance explains why we probably find it in retail products. Dr. Sung went on to be the director of the Clinical Research Center at the, um, the only TB hospital in uh, South Korea, and more recently has uh, left that position to join a startup company 
that has molecular diagnostics that allow the uh, detection of a panel of problems in the case of these respiratory diseases for GI diseases and his job there is to bring mycobacterial infections into their diagnostic portfolio. ELISA is a technology and it's most often used to detect antibodies. You can do that in milk samples or blood samples. Um, one of my technicians, Jolie Kramsky, uh, came from the MedTech program here at UW, was working in my laboratory as a routine diagnostic uh, technician. She decided to do a master's degree and work on a project that was born in our laboratory. These diagnostic kits were able to detect antibodies produced by cows, but not by any other animal species. And one of the animals, kinds of animals that gets Yoni's disease are camelids. Llama, alpaca, guanaco, South American three-chamber stomach animals. So she took the commercial kit and she modified it so that it would work for diagnosis of Yoni's disease on blood samples from these camelids. She's had a wonderful career. She went on to get a PhD and is uh, now an associate professor at the University of Utah School of Medicine. And she's also the medical director in a very prominent reference laboratory in Utah. These ELISAs measure quantitatively the, the amount of antibody. Uh, like most diagnostic kits, the level of antibody is interpreted as either being negative, we don't think the animal's infected, or positive, it has a high enough value that we think, yeah, the animal's probably infected. But <clears throat> all of the kits were based on a positive negative interpretation, and I thought we could get more information out of that. And so, looked at how high are these results coming out of the ELISA kit? And based on how high they are, called the ELISA SP, what's the probability that these cows actually have paratuberculosis? We showed a very strong uh, relationship between the two, and now most laboratories today will report not just positive negative, but how positive is it? Is it low, medium, or high? Because it has direct bearing on the likelihood the animal's infected, and how soon the animal is going to show clinical disease and whether the animal is going to be low on milk production. We were the first lab to evaluate five uh, different uh, ELISA tests that were commercially available and we did this because we had access to so many cows in Wisconsin that were proven to be infected or proven not to be infected. And this is a large collaborative effort with researchers at the University of Minnesota um, as well as University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Whitlock, and uh, my former boss, Dr. Ron Schultz. Another grad student that came to me is a veterinarian from South Korea again, Dr. Dong Hee Cho, and uh, he came with the idea of trying to find or build a better mousetrap, if you will, see if we could improve on these ELISA tests. It involves some fancy technology where you break up the germ and to its smallest bits and parts, and then you take a, an agarose gel and you spread out those antigens based on their size. Here you see the kilodalton markers and their isoelectric point. You see the pH values up at the top. And you get a two-dimensional grid of all these spots. Each of those is a different protein or subcomponent of protein. Some of them, the blue spots, are the ones we find in all the mycobacteria. They're common antigens not particularly useful diagnostically. The red ones are antigens that are unique to paratuberculosis. Those are the kinds we would like to build into our diagnostic assays. So <clears throat> from those, those proteasome evaluations, uh, we, built, we discovered novel antigens, we built them into a novel improved ELISA and uh, gave it to Worf for patenting. The next question that presents itself when you're working with dairy farms is, okay, uh, you have a nice diagnostic test and you can tell me that it has a certain sensitivity and specificity, but how is that going to improve my bottom line? So <clears throat> using economic decision analysis, uh, this gentleman, uh, Nate Dorhorst, uh, a veterinary student at the time, did his, uh, worked with me for, during his four years in veterinary school. The only guy I know who graduated from the vet school with a 4.0 average. And he put the data into uh, economic terms. So the farmer 
is making decisions, and this is decision analysis. How much money should I invest to improve the hygiene in my maternity pen to hopefully stop transmission of paratuberculosis to calves? Should I use a diagnostic test? Yes or no. If I choose to use a test, which of the five available tests should I use? Each of them has different accuracies and different costs. And when I get my test results back, maybe they're high, medium, or low, or negative, what do I do with that? What do I do with that information? Do I cull the cow, send it to slaughter? That's about a $1,500 loss because you've got to replace the cow. Or should I just keep the cow but maybe isolate it someplace? That's going to take some facilities design. And he looked at all this economic modeling to come up with the correct, the best answer for dairy herds of certain sizes and uh, that are commercial dairy producers, not seed stock producers. And so we're trying to translate diagnostic accuracy to economic benefit for dairy farms. All of this led to developing some consensus recommendations to veterinarians of the United States, which tests to use under which circumstances and how to uh, handle those test results. Uh, that was with uh, Alan Roussel from Texas A&M, Frank Gehry from Colorado State, uh, Scott Wells from the University of Minnesota, and Ian Gardner who was then at the veterinary school at UC Davis. We also, in that publication, wanted to talk to people or tell people, just like Beach and Hastings did, how do you prevent this? Because herds become infected by buying, unintentionally, healthy-looking animals that, unfortunately, are infected with paratuberculosis. So when people ask, how do I get it? I say, you paid good money for it. You bought it. And this comes down to the bio biosecurity challenge again. And in that publication, we tried to lay out uh, in fairly simple language, how can you avoid this? Well, the first recommendation is buy from a herd that is qualified by those USDA standards as having being not infected. It's a very high standard. Not many herds meet that. So herd owners will say, well, I can't do that. How about what's next? Well. You can ask, uh, maybe the veterinarian has already set up a testing program. It's not a USDA sanctioned one, but it is a testing program and there's good data on which to safely choose animals to buy. And if they can't do that, you can say, well, maybe you can just do some pre-purchase testing of the herd, or maybe you have to just buy the cow and test it after you get it. All of these are concrete decisions that a buyer, producer has to make and all of them come with increasing risk that they're going to buy a cow with Yoni's disease. And I presume that they all come with a different price tag. They, uh, with, with, the, with, the farmer, with a dairy farmer interested in buying the top rank USDA certified data, saying I can't do that because I can't afford it, is that why? Or they should come with a higher price tag, but the rejoinder from the buyers is they, or sellers is they say, nobody's paying more money for my cow. Yeah. And that has caused the program to become stymied. Okay. Ideally, it should be economically driven, and us pointy-headed professors thought that would be an ideal model system, but the marketplace didn't, doesn't behave that way. The Backtech machi Midget Machine went through another iteration from that uh, carousel of 60 bottles. They moved to a... a container that does not contain any ra radioactive material at all. It has a fluorescent gel in the bottom that measures how much oxygen is in the tube. And so we dispensed with the radioactivity and they made a cabinet that will hold 960 of these cultures and the cabinet is the incubator. So now we don't have to move bottles around, we just put them in there, they're incubated, and this robot checks whether the oxygen in the tube has changed in concentration once an hour for a period of 50 days. Really great technology and it, ex it made things a lot faster, more efficient and cheaper. Um, Sung Jae Shin, shown here, was a postdoc that joined my lab and we had to recalibrate everything in terms of our ability to count uh, paratuberculosis bacteria, so he made a regression curve that shows the number of days until the uh, assay 
Cake's positive is directly related to the number of organisms that were inoculated into the tube. Again, allowing us to process a fecal sample from a cow and estimate are they shedding low numbers of paratuberculosis or very high numbers, plus other research applications. He is now a professor at the um, main university in Seoul, Yongsai University. We use that counting technology for a variety of applications, but this is a very obvious one. Um, Dr. Manju Krishnan came to my laboratory with a quest of uh, trying to test paratuberculosis bacteria to see which antibiotics might kill them. Now these antibiotics aren't used in dairy cattle because they would cost thousands of dollars. The drugs are illegal for use in food producing animals. So this was not for the quest of treating cows, but rather for treating Crohn's disease patients. So you see on this list all of the cultures that we tested for this antibiotic acceptability originated from Crohn's disease patient with the exception of one from a cow that we used sort of as a control organism. And that was one of the first studies ever reported that listed the drugs that are capable of killing paratuberculosis bacteria, at least in vitro, in the test tube. She uh, returned to her original post as a senior scientist at the Drug Research Institute in, in India and continues working on mycobacteria, particularly uh, testing tuberculosis from humans and its drug susceptibility. Had some great CALS collaborations. Um, we, this was the brainchild of Dr. George Shook, he joined us here, now uh, Professor Emeritus. Uh, George conned me into testing 10,000 Holstein cows and figuring out which ones had paratuberculosis and which ones didn't. And then his staff and laboratory figured out if there are any genetic differences between the Holsteins that had the infection and the Holsteins that were exposed, same herds, but didn't have the infection finding some markers, some SNPs, and then <clears throat> we repeated that exercise with 5,000 Jersey cattle um, in 2014. This was all, a lot of this research was built on the backbone of the fact that my laboratory didn't set out to become a diagnostic laboratory, but because we were doing all the diagnostics and doing these field studies, uh, we became a diagnostic laboratory. And uh, like most little businesses, we needed a website, so we created the Yonis Information Center, yonis.org. I invite you all to check in on that if you'd like. But it was mostly a vehicle for advertising our testing services, as you see here. And I'll come back to this a little bit more later. But since 1991, we've done about three quarter of a million tests, uh, most of them using the ELISA technology for antibody and serum, and uh, the more Popular tests today, we've done a couple hundred thousand uh, PCRs for paratuberculosis, on mostly on fecal samples. These are some of the staff that have driven this program. Dr. Becky Manning got her veterinary degree here. She also uh, was useful to me because she has an MBA from Stanford and a degree from Yale. And she was the overseer for much of our diagnostic service. And uh, my lab manager, Brenna Kunkel, uh, Kelly Anklum, and Heather Cushing are all primary drivers. Um, added, we've added a few and subtracted a few others over the years, but these um, women have been with me for 20 years. It's interesting, it gives you a first-hand experience of what is it like to be in a diagnostic lab. You know, you can design these beautiful little assays and think that everything's hunky-dory, but you should really go out in the field and, and see what this is like. So things happen, like people don't know how to ship samples to the laboratory, so they come in, uh, lots of tubes, lots of mess, broken samples, uh, bloody submission sheets, or people will put fecal samples in these snap cap tubes and fail to keep it cold, so the microbes produce gas, blow the top off the tube, and you get cow shit everywhere. <laughs> so that's the real world, you get a chance to experience that. Uh, the capacity to do a lot of diagnostic tests has been very advantageous to us in some of our field investigations. I'll just show you a couple of them. This is the farm of uh, Steve and Pat Kling. They recognized that they had, they and their veterinarian recognized they had a very serious Yoni's disease problem. And they went looking for some financial help and they approached the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board and said, can you, can, can you figure out a way to help this? And they called me and we formed a three-way partnership 
and we uh, tackled uh, control of Yoni's disease. We actually tackled eradication of Yoni's disease on their farm in 1995. Uh, this is a picture of their farm because they were the host for one of the dairy breakfasts that year. And uh, here you see Steve Kling, uh, Becky Manning, going over the list of cows that we had to test. Here you see some of the laboratory staff and uh, numerous fecal samples that had to be processed. Again, we were doing both the blood test, called ELISA, and the manure test, in that case culture, using those back tech systems. And we, uh, we had a high hurdle to meet, and that's because the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board said we only give out grants for 12 months. And I tried to explain, this disease has an incubation period of five years. How, how, do, I, how do I deal with a, this disease in a 12-month grant cycle? But um, we did it. We successfully eradicated the disease from the farm. Now, Truth be told, there weren't a lot of the original animals left in the herd by the time we got done. Um, but that farm became free of paratuberculosis and remained free of paratuberculosis for well over a decade. Because the animals died, or what would happen? When you said we, you a lot of the when we diagnosed that they had paratuberculosis, they were sent to slaughter. Uh, okay. um, another major project, in, again funded in large measure by the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board, but all, also the USDA, was to take our best plans, all this economic decision analysis, all the best technology we had for diagnostics, and go out to some commercial dairy farms in Wisconsin that had a significant Yoni's disease problem and say, can we actually control this? And <clears throat> so we selected farms that were nominated by the veterinarians from across the state. The uh, smallest was uh, not, not too far from us here, 80 cow stanchion barn. The largest up near Wanakee was 1,400 cows in free stalls. Most of them were two to 400 uh, uh, head in free stall operations. And in order to get into the project, they had to have a significant rate of Yoni's disease, which we justified as having at least 10% of the herd being blood test positive, ELISA positive, for paratuberculosis. The goal then being to bring that number down significantly. This project was uh, led by a re uh, bovine practitioner who had recently retired from practice, uh, Vic Eggleston, and he was the main driver. And we successfully con controlled Yoni's disease, and I think this one individual deserves all the credit because it is Yoni's disease control is like uh, your next favorite diet plan. Um, it requires a life coach. It requires somebody who checks in with you periodically and says, are you still doing this? You know, because we agreed that you would do this. Uh, are you still walking around the block twice a week, um, etc." So Vic was the life coach and he went back to these farms and checked with them that they were following the protocol. The protocol involved testing all the cows once every year by a blood test slaughtering those that were blood test positive, and making changes to the way they raise calves to prevent new infections. When we arrived on the farm, uh, among a cohort of first lactation cows, over 10% were positive. This is pooling all the data from all the cows and all nine herds that finished the study. By the time we were finished, six years later, we'd reduced that number to 3.2%. Very significant drop, highly successful program, it was not intended to eradicate the infection. The intention was to control it to a level that, where the disease is no longer economically important to the dairy producer and keep it there. This was published in 2010 in uh, the Journal of Dairy Science. This is the team of people who uh, did this. We had a little bit of a party as we were wrapping up this project. Everybody was sort of glad to see it done. Here you see Vic and, and uh, Brenna. Heather, Becky's here, and they all worked hard. I didn't know about this, but they made t-shirts uh, that said, I survived the WMMB, Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board project. Here you see the cows sitting on top of the poor laboratory technicians uh, reflecting their attitude about my idea for doing this project. And uh, the, these people tested 3,500 cattle once a year by both blood and fecal culture um, for a period of six years. So a lot of credit goes to them. When you start doing all this work and you uh, provide publications and you have websites, you get a lot of phone calls. I call it practicing telemedicine. 
And so I've had some really interesting calls over the day, over the years, and um, they've led to some interesting problems. Uh, we were one of the first labs to diagnose paratuberculosis in these animals. These are uh, tule elk, also called golden mantled elk. It's a subspecies of elk that you only find in uh, Point Reyes National Seashore, this isolated seashore out here. And the habitat managers there have a huge problem because no animals can leave this preserve and there's no predators. So they keep multiplying and they're overgrazing and there are a few farms left there, and the farms are rather upset about the intense elk population, but the elk have a chronic contagious infectious disease, namely Yoni's disease. And so wildlife people can't translocate them to other places and establish the herd in other locations because they're infected. And it's a conundrum that was there in 1997, and in the last 20 years hasn't changed one iota. They're still infected, they still can't translocate them. We also diagnosed it closer to home. This uh, six-month-old North American elk uh, was found infected in a herd in southern Minnesota. In fact, all 15 of the elk born on this ranch um, developed paratuberculosis because of a contaminated wallow, mud hole, that they all like to populate. We diagnosed it in bison. Um, the, we diagnosed it in the largest herd of bison in the country, owned by uh, Ted Turner. And we've diagnosed it in Wisconsin bison. This one happens to be photographed here in Wisconsin. And learned a lot about paratuberculosis, and <clears throat> veterinarians are commonly looking at diseases in multiple species, both animals and humans, as well as different animals. And bison, the pathology is slightly different, their behavior, their immune response, the diagnostics are all slightly different from what we see in cows. And so this comparative pathology aspect helps uh, understand the disease better. We made a diagnosis uh, with the help of the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Group in Georgia. We made a diagnosis in these little tiny deer in the Florida Keys, called the key deer. Uh, there too, the population, it's a somewhat uh, endangered population, uh, and this chronic disease isn't helping them recover. We made a diagnosis in a mandrel baboon. This was the second case report in, in public literature about paratuberculosis occurring in non-human primates. This uh, mandrel baboon was at the Lincoln Zoo in Chicago, and by coincidence or not, uh, the keeper in charge of this animal had Crohn's disease. One of my classmates called me and said, I've got a, I got a client with pygmy goats in Minnesota. Can you come and take a look at it? I think it might be paratuberculosis. So I made a deal, uh, commonly making deals, and I said, well, I'll test all of these animals for free with all of the available tests that I've got if the owner will agree to donate all of the goats that I declare to be infected. And they said, no problem, fine. So um, we brought 12 of those pygmy goats back to the University of Wisconsin. We're able to then monitor these animals, testing them with all of our available tests and watch what happens following natural exposure to this infection. And uh, they have some really cute little animals. This uh, female looked in, in pretty good shape but uh, died of paratuberculosis um, a month after having this little kid. And, and the owner, by the time he got done, uh, didn't have too many of his original animals left. This has always helped with collaborators, particularly pathologists, like you see photographed here, Howard Steinberg, a pathologist in our department in the vet school. Uh, North American zoos have had paratuberculosis introduced. We first started down this road working with North American zoos in 19, early 1990 um, because, again, a classmate of mine from the University of Minnesota was the chief veterinarian for the San Diego Wild Animal Park, and we tested all of their animals and continued testing their, their animals as well as uh, many other zoos around North America. And it provides for some fun field trips. When we get a chance to be in California, they're take us on some vaccine trips. Here's Becky Manning uh, with a giraffe, and here's Jolie Kramsky, 
And here's Brenna. She didn't like this photograph because she was pregnant, but that's what happens. Um, our best case of the year so far this year is a story about Petey. Petey is a pot-bellied pig. And a couple years ago, I had a call from a veterinary student at the University of Minnesota. She said, I have a pot-bellied pig. Um, no, I have, a, I have a goat named Nibble, sorry, and it doesn't look too good. And send samples, and I said, well, I'm sorry, but Nibbles has Yoni's disease. And Nibbles was uh, humanely euthanized and necropsied, confirming paratuberculosis. Two years later, this fall, she called and said, my pot-bellied pig isn't looking very good. And uh, do you think there could have been disease transmission? I said, well, it's rarely reported in pigs, but I suppose it's possible. Well, Petey went downhill pretty fast, uh, ended up on the necropsy table at the University of Minnesota. This is uh, Petey's intestine. It's dramatically thickened. Um, and when we did sections, you can see the huge thickening of the mucosa. And when we stain that for special stains to see mycobacteria, all of those phagocytes, those macrophages, are packed full of acid-fast bacteria. So Petey got paratuberculosis probably from his pen mate Nibbles, and with the help of whole genome sequencing here on the campus, we hope to absolutely prove that conclusively uh, within the next month or so. It gave me a chance to work with another pathologist, uh, and that was kind of fun because he's my brother. Our efforts in outreach and education um, have been multifold. Uh, one of them uh, pertained to my third sabbatical while here at the university. With the help from the Fulbright Foundation, I went to Valdivia, Chile, worked at the veterinary school there, um, taught a graduate course in pathogenic bacteriology, as well as worked with their very um, young paratuberculosis program. The very first herd I ever got to see is this beautiful herd of Angus cows. The, this breeder had a business objective of taking YU bulls, a special Japanese breed of bull with good marbling meat, and cross them over these whole, uh, Angus cows to produce the F1 cross, which uh, sells for upwards of $50 a pound in, in uh, Japan. Sadly, he added some skinny cows, and this was one of them, and uh, we said, he said, well, how, how do we make a diagnosis? I said, well, really necropsy is the best thing. And two days later, the cow is on the necropsy table, and we again confirmed paratuberculosis in this very high profile um, and expensive, expensive herd. Chile is a fantastic place to live and work, and uh, this is uh, Via Rica, one of the active volcanoes in Chile. And uh, I've gone back to Chile about six times since that sabbatical, continuing research projects there. And this is with Miguel, Miguel Salgado. Uh, he and I climbed Via Rica in uh, what was it? 2008, yeah. And it was good timing because in 2013 uh, the volcano erupted. It was a good time not to be up there. This is an example of some of the novel research they've done there. <clears throat> they've been able to take um, native pastures, totally undisturbed soil, cut out a block of it down a foot deep, lift it up on a piece of plywood, and set it on a platform, and then create a designated slope for the pasture on that platform, capturing in troughs at the end all of the runoff after creating that experimental plot, and they did uh, some 20 of them, they would apply paratuberculosis-contaminated manure, just like a manure spreader would driving down the field, and then let nature take its course with rainwater falling on that plot and washing off whatever's on the surface. And from that work, they were able to uh, show that paratuberculosis that is applied to these soils, even with a moderate slope, runs off into the surface water and then that ends up in our lakes and our streams, and it may end up in public water supplies depending on the source of water. Our outreach efforts have mostly been online. Uh, we've created uh, six module courses that uh, grant veterinarians uh, the title of certif Yoni Certified Veterinarian, allowing them to participate in those USDA programs that I described earlier. Most states in the country accept this training. 
Uh, it's built around the idea of risk assessments, uh, where veterinarians would go on the farm and look at how cattle are being managed, look how calves are being reared, and help the farmer prioritize where do they have to make changes in their management in order to stop the spread of paratuberculosis. Initially, all this was done on, on paper, and in 2016, uh, I can't see it there, but the Food Animal Production Medicine Group uh, helped me convert that into uh, uh, an app. So you can all do this, do all this risk assessment now on an iPad, and then just as a plug for some of the other things they, they've done, they have scoring calf health, scoring uh, body condition and lameness, uh, judging facilities design, parlor design, and, and reproduction. All of these are apps available for use on iPads uh, through the Food Animal Production Medicine Group. Uh, this gave birth to the Veterinary School's online CE program where there are a number of courses and some of those courses are for producers and they're given uh, away freely. Back to the website again, this is our major outreach vehicle. Up here you can choose uh, any number of animal species, cattle, sheep, goats, etc. and get information on all these topic areas. Uh, there are a lot of images there and um, that people are welcome to freely borrow. Again, that upgrade was sponsored by the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. Google Analytics allows us to watch uh, who comes, and so we can see that we get uh, roughly 4,000 users, uh, new users in a month, and we can uh, chart where those users are coming from. Uh, any shade of blue indicates that somebody in 2017 came to our site from those countries. So we have a, a global reach, the Wisconsin idea. My favorite story, and I'm just about done, promise, is uh, this poster, which uh, was created for, as a 4-H project by a, a young 10 or 11-year-old girl. And as you, she, she did her poster presentation on Yoni's disease, as you can see, we have some skinny cows. That's from our website. There's Becky Van Boxtel's favorite picture, another uh, thickened intestine, and those culture tubes for growing paratuberculosis. And she made this very lovely poster for her 4-H project. And lo and behold, she turned up to be in our veterinary class. And she was in my uh, class that I taught last fall uh, for bacteriology. And uh, Lizzie said she got a, a blue ribbon for that 4-H project. <laughs> so great story, closing the loop, um, seeing, seeing us stimulate young, bright minds who come back and join our veterinary school. So back to Beach and Hastings. Uh, the challenge still remains to prevent the introduction of this infection into other healthy herds and to try to eliminate it. Uh, the job hasn't gotten any easier. In fact, probably gotten a bit harder. If we had listened to Beach and Hastings back in 1922, we would be way farther down the road than we are today. Um, so there's lots of challenges that still exist. And they involve everything, outreach education, field investigations, research. Uh, I like the, the holistic approach to these problems. It's not the same as uh, detailed molecular biology, but I think it's translational science that has a lot of uh, real world impact. And again, I thank Dr. Easterday for allowing me to come here and enjoy 35 years of a, a wonderful career at, at Madison. The story will continue with another colleague in our department, Dr. Adel Talat. He's a molecular biologist studying mycobacterial infections, both kind that cause tuberculosis as well as paratuberculosis. And it's hoped that the vaccine that's been developed by his laboratory, patented by Wharf and licensed by a pharmaceutical company, may help us have one more tool in the battle uh, against paratuberculosis. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Well, what kind of, as a food consumer of dairy products, what kind of, tell me about food safety when in, in undiagnosed animals that uh, f there aren't any there aren't any simple answers. One uh, facet of this disease that is true in all the animal species we know of is a very very young that are susceptible, and animal as animals get older they develop much more resistance. 
Experimentally, we've shown we could take an adult cow and give it a massive dose of the organism and infect it, but I don't think that's real world. That, so for you and I, at our age, I don't think it's an issue in the least. For young children, I'm much more concerned. And there aren't any simple answers because it's evidently in the food supply. The cows that we diagnose on farms and are sent to slaughter, they go mostly into ground beef production. So we have, we have ground beef, we have milk, probably heading the list, as everybody would expect, is raw milk. It's not smart for this pathogen and many others to drink raw milk, but yeah, dairy products of all kinds. It's been isolated from hard cheeses, uh, fresh cheeses. Um, I haven't seen anybody tackle yogurt yet, but the conditions are right for survival there as well. So it's, it's a problem. But before we can tackle this as a food safety issue, medical science, medical doctors, the Centers for Disease Control has to say, yes, this is a zoonotic pathogen. Yeah. That's, that's their job. And any damage that's caused while they think about it is their responsibility in my book. Other questions? George. For 20% of Crohn disease patients are cultured with that. Any thought as to where the rest of it comes from, or uh, is that a suspect or a cause? Causality, yeah. The question is, uh, is, is paratuberculosis in those intestines of Crohn's patients, is, is, does that indicate a causal relationship? And causality in human beings is very, very tough to prove, ironclad proof. If you wanted to prove whether paratuberculosis can cause the infection in a pot-bellied pig, you just expose them and see what happened. But you're not going to be able to expose 100 uh, one-year-old children and wait 20 years, the typical incubation period, and say, oh, yeah, it does cause Crohn's disease and we have no way to treat it. I mean, these experiments aren't going to get done. So you have to use circumstantial evidence. But I think the circumstantial evidence is quite strong. The pathology is the same. The host response is the same. They have antibody titers. They have cellular immunity to paratuberculosis. You find the organism more often by PCR than by culture. Uh, the evidence is pretty strong. The counter argument for others is that, no, Crohn's disease has another cause. And this damaged intestine gets colonized secondarily by this pathogen. It could be the other way around. Uh, if it was my intestine, I wouldn't be happy to have this pathogen there, whether it was there first or second. Um, so it may still deserve treatment, even if it there came there second. But it's really tough because the incubation period is so long and we can't experimentally challenge. So the one thing that might tip the balance is an ongoing uh, clinical trial by a, an Israeli pharmaceutical company to treat Crohn's disease with a cocktail of three antibiotics, all, of, well, all three of which are targeted against this pathogen, uh, treating patients for over a year with these, this cocktail of three drugs. If they show significant clinical improvement in those patients, I think both the patients will want this therapy and their doctors will be happy that they have something that might be treating a cause rather than just the symptoms. Today, all the treatments are symptomatic. Suppress the immune response, suppress the immune response. Yeah. Bernie? I just wanted to say uh, thanks for uh, thanks for uh, 35 years of work, which seems to show that we do know a little bit more than we did in 1915. We do know a bit more. But, but the, the basic facts were the same back then. We, we could have done this with what Beach and Hastings told us. We could have blocked this infection from spreading, I think. That's sort of my point there, yeah. Anything else? Again, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.